So, uh, I'm talking about um, endobarrier and 10-year cardiovascular risk. Um, these are my disclosures, and the ADA have asked that there be no photo photos taken. Um, and I'd like to start with this definition of diabetes from 1980, which stresses the chronic hyperglycemia but nothing else. And this redefinition by Miles Fisher in 1996, which mentions the hyperglycemia and the microvascular complications, but puts out in front that diabetes type 2 is a state of premature cardiovascular death. Um, and we're talking about endobarrier, a, a two foot long um, impermeable sleeve which is implanted in the simple endoscopy procedure into the first part of the uh, small intestine such that the food passes through the itch rather than the full small intestine and that leads to a great big amount of weight loss and improvement in glycemic control and um, it mimics the bypass bit of the Rouen Y bariatric surgery procedure except that it goes in in a simple endoscopy procedure and uh, after a year the device is removed again in a simple endoscopy procedure and the patient's back to normal, uh, but with a fresh start. Um, and uh, it's worth remembering that endoscopy units and endoscopists are all over the place uh, in, in health services, so potentially this could very easily go far and wide. Um, the most important slides that I'm going to show you actually are the five after the acknowledgements, and I hope the chairman will still be with me in allowing me to show them, but because this is a scientific meeting, meeting we have to have some um, uh, numbers and p-values first. Um, uh, this uh, revised diabetes study is in the National, British National Health Service, um, uh, an NHS uh, supported study in Birmingham, London and Glasgow. And uh, in the NHS uh, one couldn't imagine doing such a procedure as this without first trying a GLP-1 receptor agonist because GLP-1 receptor agonists also reduce weight and improve glycemic control. So uh, entry criteria was the patient uh, had to have been on loraglutide for at least six months, and yet we're still with a hemoglobin A1C more than 7.5% and with a BMI over 35. Uh, we had some exclusion criteria, and I particularly draw attention to the fact that if the patient was on aspirin for secondary prevention, uh, they weren't allowed into the study in case the aspirin increased the bleeding risk. Uh, we randomized the 70 patients into uh, adding the endobarrier and continuing the loraglutide. Uh, and I point out that the only dose of loraglutide supported by the British National Health Service is the 1.2 milligram dose. Uh, and so that's what the patients had. Uh, in an another group, we discontinued the loraglutide and gave them an endobarrier and then by way of compensation for the third group who didn't get an endobarrier, we were allowed them to have the 1.8 milligram dose of loraglutide. Uh, all the patients had the standard two-week liquid then puree diet which allows the endobarrier to settle into place and the results I'm showing here are the results after one year of this two-year study uh, and the last data from the f end of the first year became available in April of this year. And uh, the baseline characteristics of the patients, they were over 50, uh, they had a long duration of diabetes, over 10 years, a lot of hypertensive patients, a lot of them on insulin, BMI was over 40, and the hemoglobin A1C about 9.5%, so a very overweight, poorly controlled group of patients. Uh, and these are the headline results which were presented at end of 2016. Um, uh, and uh, you, the blue is the endobarrier and loraglutide, the yellow just the endobarrier, and the brown the 1.8 milligram dose of loraglutide. And you can see both the endobarrier groups lost a lot of weight, 11 or 12 kilograms, but it was really the endobarrier and loraglutide group that got the big drop in hemoglobin A1c, 2.1%. So to some extent, henceforth, that is our group of most interest. In a subgroup, in a sub-study, we looked at liver fat using MRI scanning, uh, and this baseline, the difference between these two MRI scans that you can see clearly is because of the amount of fat, 
and four months after end of Barry, you can see the difference has disappeared, which indicates that the fat has gone out of the liver, uh, and these are the actual measurements, a tremendous reduction in liver fat because of the weight loss. And these are the actual figures, both a reduction in hepatic fat, uh, big significant, and pancreatic fat. Um, this is not a new observation with big weight loss. Uh, Roy Taylor's group in Newcastle in their landmark paper in 2011 showed the same thing. Uh, I'd like to suggest that it doesn't take much imagination, however, to think that with all this fat going out of the liver and pancreas, maybe fat is also going out of the coronary arteries and carotid arteries uh, with this big weight loss. Uh, we would need a big leader type study or MPREG study to demonstrate, uh, of course, that the cardiovascular outcomes were, were greatly reduced, uh, which we aren't going to get, but perhaps as a poor man's version, um, we can use the risk calculators. In the United Kingdom, the Q-Risk 2 is widely used in primary care. Uh, however, its problem is that it only asks, do you have diabetes or not? Um, it doesn't actually take into account at all how long you've had diabetes and how bad is the haemoglobin A1C. And the same thing applies to the Framingham calculators. So really the only one that's of use for our group of very long-term diabetes patients with a high haemoglobin A1C is the UK PDS risk, UK PDS risk engine, which looks at um, duration of diabetes and haemoglobin A1C, but sadly doesn't look at BMI. So I think even this calculator is underestimating the risk in our very overweight patients. These are the baseline numbers using the different risk engines uh, and with all the groups uh, there's a, a, a reduction but the biggest reduction in the group where we used endobarrier with liraglutide uh, and I'm going to concentrate on the UK PDS risk engine which we think is the one that's nearest as most applicable to our patients uh, and the group that we had endobarra with liraglutide. And you can see um, with this risk engine, uh, big reductions in um, cases of um, coronary heart disease, stroke, and lives saved predicted. And indeed, the headline is that 22 patients out of 100 will not have a CHD or stroke event because of endobarrier, and 18 lives will be saved. There were uh, some serious adverse events, uh, one GI bleed, two cases of obstruction at about six months which, in which the endobarrier had to be removed. Both these patients have got a lot of benefit already by that time and two liver abscesses which I could talk about if there was time in discussion. Um, uh, all the patients, I should say, uh, had a full recovery for, following removal of endobarrier. So in summary, adding, adding endobarrier to liraglutide resulted in a big 12 kilogram weight loss uh, and a big drop in BMI, uh, a big drop in haemoglobin A1C, a, a drop in insulin dose in those that were on insulin, a drop in systolic blood pressure and a, a drop in cardiovascular risk as assessed by the UK PDS risk engine. So in conclusion, these data suggest that adding an endobarrier in patients who are suboptimally performing on the GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy rather than switching to the endobarrier or increasing the GLP-1 uh, has a useful role in the management of refractory diabetes and obesity. Uh, lots of people to acknowledge, and you can download the slides, but I'd particularly like to draw attention to the Association of British Clinical Diabetologists who funded the study. And I'd like to end up with um, some actual patients um, from the study and who've had endo barriers and who I think speak uh, volumes and to some extent if we take this patient with his uh, initial haemoglobin A1C and his end haemoglobin A1C, I've translated the weight loss into uh, American units, a 48 pound at weight loss. But if, you, if we look at this compared to that, do we need a leader study to tell us that this patient is heading for a stroke or a heart attack and death in the not too distant future, uh, whereas maybe now, you know, he has a much reduced chance of those problems, this man in his early 60s.
Here's another such case. You can see the same a big reduction in hemoglobin C in weight. Uh, and, and notably in this patient, he was on 100 units of insulin and he no longer needs insulin. This lady here uh, had obstructive sleep apnea requiring CPAP ventilation overnight. And after her big weight loss and improvement in hemoglobin A1C, she no longer requires CPAP. This gentleman here actually had interstitial lung disease and had to carry around ambulatory oxygen all through his days. Uh, and after the weight loss, he no longer needed the ambulatory oxygen uh, and he no longer needed insulin either. And finally, this lady here uh, went from obese BMI to normal BMI uh, with endo endobarrier treatment. Um, in the wake of our one year data, the, the British Broadcasting has a news item and you can find it on YouTube by typing in ABCD and endobarrier. And this is the BBC News reporter uh, looking inside the shirt that this man used to wear and commenting that you could get another person in there. Uh, so that's all I have to say and I'm ready to take any questions. Thank you. So keep things on track. Uh, we have time for one question only. So uh, I, like, I like the end of barrier, but the liver abscesses are really worrisome. And I think they actually stopped the U.S. study due to the, to the abscesses. I wonder what your comment would be on the future of end of barrier in, in the face of uh, the liver abscess issue and how you, they might get around it. I'm glad that's the one question I can, can, can speak to. Uh, the things to say about liver abscess is that for some reason it's, they occurred on the grand scale in the FDA trial, but it hasn't been the experience of us around the world uh, on, to the same extent. If I can share with you this, what, this patient that we had in our study, this is her liver abscess. She didn't have antibiotic cover for the implantation and the abscess occurred at six weeks. And we'd like to suggest that if she'd had antibiotic cover in the, for the implantation, she may not have got it. She was doing so well, she refused to have the endobarrier out. With antibiotics, the, endobar the abscess disappeared uh, and she managed to get an 18.9 kilogram weight loss and she did very well, uh, even though it was left in. This gentleman here, I think, um, says a lot. Uh, he refused, he, he failed to turn up to have his endobarrier out at one year and he got his liver abscess two and a half months later um, uh, 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 and uh, it was drained. Uh, and uh, um, he treated with antibiotics and he was okay. But uh, two of the uh, FDA liver abscesses occurred after explantation. Uh, and that suggests that maybe if you had antibiotic cover for explantation, you would get rid of them. Most of the FDA liver abscesses occurred after late in the, in the year. So it may be if we took the endobarrier out after nine months, uh, you, we, you would avoid them. And if you had antibiotic cover for implant and explant, and, and I know the company are thinking of all these possibilities for another FDA study. Thank you.